This is episode 243 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point, New Mexico. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Well, Wally, another week and another update on the health orders as handed down by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. And, uh, you know, I think this one was interesting in the sense that relative to a lot of the things that she was, she's done over the uh, many months of lockdown, a lot of what she seems to be trying to do here had uh, a little more targeted approach and a little more sensibility to it. Uh, of course, it's worth noting that the numbers are at unprecedented levels in terms of the spread, uh, the death rate in terms of people dying on a day-to-day -day basis has not moved very much, but we are uh, setting records on a fairly regular basis, and if not at records, they're at very elevated levels in terms of the spread of the virus. Now, uh, you know, what's go through a few of the things that the uh, uh, governor handed down. Uh, Hotspot businesses, businesses that had four rapid responses will be closed. Uh, 10 p.m. closing time for retail in general, which we've kind of gone through with restaurants and bars. Uh, New Mexico safe training, which is a training to be uh, safe in their approach to COVID for employees. Uh, state museums, closed uh, as well. And, uh, you know, what's your general impression of these, Wally? Well, I think they have had a bit more finesse than they have in the past. And frankly, I think it's uh, long overdue. You know, back to the fact that the, the spread is up, but the death rate remains relatively low. So something's happening there. Uh, you know, I've looked at a lot of the data and boy, uh, Data is uh, tough to come by in terms of to really get a lot of insightful analysis, but it seems like uh, the hospitals are better at treating patients once they hit the hospital. That's good. It seems like the average age of people contracting uh, the virus and the number of underlying conditions they have is lessened, so it's not as bad. And then the penalty, if you will, or the price that needs to be paid if a business now is shut down. We don't have payroll protection loans. We don't have a lot of things that are in place the first time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, businesses, uh, small business in particular, uh, that are at risk of uh, going bankrupt, going out of business. And if they're, you're to close small businesses down again, I think the number of business failures, failures will be astronomical. And finally, yes, they have a lot of data about people getting... COVID-19, these rapid responses for people getting sick at work, but that's a very small percentage of the total spread. They don't either don't know or aren't saying where the other uh, overwhelming 90 plus percent of the spread comes from. And so I think that maybe either the practical or political calculus is it worth killing all the small businesses in New Mexico for something we're not sure is going to work. Maybe the answer turned out to me no at this point. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's a lot to unpack here. We're going to unpack as much as we can. But, you know, the idea of the four rapid responses, I mean, the last thing you want is a business hiding and covering rapid responses. So uh, that could be, you know, you get to three rapid responses and suddenly you're, you know, shaking your, in your shoes. Do I do something that's potentially going to close my business? So we're not saying that all of these uh, things make sense from the governor's office. They are at least targeted in ways that previously we just seen, a, you know, when all the world is a nail, uh, you, 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 all you've got is a hammer, that, that kind of approach that the governor's taken. And I think overall it's clear that what she has been doing has not been working as a general rule. Uh, and perhaps she could have been more nuanced earlier on in her approach. And if necessary, then uh, brought out more, uh, you know, deep, far-ranging measures. But 
you know, kind of just to give you an idea, this, this kind of stuff really uh, threw me for a bit of a loop, Wally. So the peak number in terms of the seven-day rolling average, this is all from the uh, New York Times, the various, very highest rolling average we had over the summer was July 29th when uh, the average of uh, rolling cases over seven days was 330. Uh, so July 29th, that was the peak rolling average over the summer and all the way back to the very beginning of this thing back in March. Then we saw uh, a reduction, slow but steady, into late September, early October, uh, when we were down at 81 uh, new cases in a day, a seven-day rolling average, uh, dipped as low as 88 on September the 12th. Now the rolling uh, seven-day average, this is new reported cases, at his, his rolling average at 725. So we are just head and shoulders, uh, not just head and shoulders, we're more than double where we were in terms of the seven-day rolling average of new cases back in the middle of the summer. Now, uh, you know, granted, this is happening relatively quickly, but we've been on this upward swing, like I said, since the very beginning of October. Uh, on May 15th, we had our peak of new deaths uh, per day, seven-day rolling average of 10. Uh, and this is not to discount any of this. We're just talking about policies, and uh, you know, we're obviously saddened, and you know, it's unfortunate any time somebody dies of this virus. But uh, the fact remains that uh, that the average now is down around five per day. So we're, despite the upward swing of new cases, the rapid rise, we are still at a level of you know, day-to-day -day, uh, deaths that's relatively within the scope of where we've been. Now, we could come back in a week and maybe that number will rise up. Uh, but right now, the virus is definitely spreading. That is the policy, by the way, that is the policy component. The spread, uh, the governor's policy has been to stop the spread. It hasn't been necessarily, you know, focused on other aspects of it. Now, we obviously have better uh, cap capability of addressing the uh, health aspects of this issue. And, you know, I, again, it's, uh, it's important to consider how much of our lives and how much of our world we want to put on hold and for how long before uh, we change direction in terms of how this virus is, is going to affect us. For example, uh, recently, and I'm Catholic, full disclosure, uh, for a while, a couple months, the Catholic Church was essentially shut down, at least in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, of which Albuquerque is a part. The uh, Now, as of Monday, same deal. The Archdiocese of Santa Fe, all Catholic masses in this northern part of the state have been canceled. And, you know, who knows? Uh, we've got uh, several feast days, but of course we are creeping up on Christmas, and we already lost Easter this year as a Catholic holiday. Uh, you know, are we going to lose uh, Christmas as well? And it's just uh, another sign of the times and another way in which uh, our day-to-day -day existence is being hugely impacted by this virus, regardless if we have if we have it or not. Yes, and uh, it is interesting that uh, the Catholic Church did that. Uh, now there's a good reason not to go to church. Uh, it won't be held. You know, let me just say that this is a extremely difficult management problem. There is no question about it. And uh, the one thing that I will go back to again and again was initially the plan was to flatten the curve, to not overwhelm the health system, because at that time they were saying there's nothing we can do to keep the virus from spreading for many months to go. It, now that's turned into possibly many more months and maybe many more years, depending on how our vaccines do. Uh, once, the, uh, once the death control was uh, relatively well in hand due to, uh, an, you know, the hospitals and the healthcare prevent profession and uh, ER docs and uh, ICU docs knowing how to best treat, the death rate went down tremendously. 
then we switch to the spread rate again. So I, I am not sure. It will be very interesting to see how the death rate compares to the spread rate this time. Um, the one thing that I have said that I'm not saying we're there yet, I'm not saying we're ever going to get there, but one thing about it is that a uh, virus that everybody gets that nobody ever dies from is akin to the common cold. And will there be a time where coronavirus, this one is much like the other coronaviruses and the rhinoviruses that cause colds, uh, will they be weakened? Will it be not that big of a deal? Or is this going to be something that we're going to deal with for years? And I think uh, maybe somewhere in between, but the point is there's no necessarily crystal ball. And a lot of the things, everything that is uh, hailed as the thing to do at one point has been turned around on, you know, 180 degrees the other direction, almost everything in the management of this. So, now are we back to minimizing the death rate because we can't control the spread? Are we going to shut the economy down and just cripple that further? And again, I'll say something that, you know, I used to say many, many weeks ago on the podcast, the economy is more than this artificial thing that just exists out there. Um, the economy is how goods and services are provided, how food, shelter, and clothing, health care, energy are provided. And so you can't shut down the entire economy. And it's interesting, you know, this whole idea about uh, we're all in this together. There are certain seg segments that their employment prospects have been uh, dramatically impacted, energy and small business, uh, hospitality and restaurants. If you're in one of those, uh, I don't know, does COVID seem uh, as bad as the prospect of having no money and uh, no prospects for a way to earn a living for a long period of time? Whereas if you're in a state government job and you can participate in Zoom meetings all day, maybe this COVID doesn't look that bad and shutdowns look like the way to go. Yeah, and uh, of course, it's also worth noting that Halloween is approaching and uh, is trick or treating has that been outlawed yet? It has not been outlawed. In fact, my yet. children, my children <laughs> will be going door to door in our West Side neighborhood. If you've got your lights on, they will be coming and asking for candy. Uh, the one that I have my questions and concerns about is given the current state of things uh, in New Mexico, unless we see a rapid improvement, and I mean rapid. Are we going to have an in-person state legislative session come January? It's going to be a lot different having, uh, you know, where we had the special session with the 20 or so bills. And they did it largely in a virtual context. Are we going to have people meeting in Santa Fe and uh, cornering legislators and having conversations in person? It will be a very tricky proposition indeed to, uh, you know, have that legislative session. So it's, uh, it definitely, in terms of the virus itself, you are, uh, you know, the data don't lie. The spread is a real problem. In terms of, you know, the e effectiveness or the deadliness, I guess, of the of the virus itself, where is that going? Yeah, is this something that maybe will uh, kind of weaken over time as we get better at dealing with it and just understand it a little better? We can all hope for that, and of course. President Trump remains very optimistic about a, uh, a vaccine coming out very soon. I have no idea, you know, if that is realistic or not. And, uh, it certainly seems that people on both sides of the political fence may not be lining up to accept that vaccine when that comes out. Uh, certainly Kamala Harris, the Democratic vice presidential candidate, and you know, I know plenty of people on both sides, like I said, of the political aisle who aren't necessarily trusting of a vaccine, you know, not just anti-vax types in general, but do you want something that was rushed? By all accounts, it was rushed. I mean, hopefully they uh, obeyed the safety protocols, but uh, is that going to be uh, something that people are willing to line up for? And is that going to stop the spread? But of course, we need the vaccine before any of that is even discussed. Yeah, and then my in my uh, my statement is that uh, when the vaccine comes, I have a feeling that if you have a Republican in the White House, Republicans are going to be more likely to want to accept the vaccine and less so on the Democrats and vice versa. 
uh, and to say that uh, a pandemic isn't politicized, everything's politicized yes. in America. Everything, you know, if there's something that's not politicized, let me know what it is. Uh, I will uh, owe you a cup of coffee because I certainly haven't found it. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, you know, state this myself before all uh, all the discussion happens before it comes out. I won't be the first in line to get it, nor will my family members. However, uh, if it's kind of uh, something that does seem to work and is really uh, having an effect on tamping down or eliminating the virus, I am more than willing to take the vaccine and have vaccinated my three children and had vaccines over the years myself. It's not that I'm anti-vax uh, or vaccine, but I just... I don't want, I, I'm not the guy that's getting in line for the roller coaster the first day of its opening. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I like to see that <laughs> everything checks out before I uh, put something like that in my body or get on the, the brand new model airplane or whatever it might be. All right. Well, Wally, the virus is probably still the number one story in our state, but very close behind it is the deal that Avangrid, a Spanish Outfit headquartered, uh, at least the North American offices are headquartered out of Connecticut. Uh, they are purchasing PNM, the major power company here for at least Albuquerque and many areas around our state. $4.3 billion deal, 20% uh, premium. And if you're listening to this but you haven't listened to the or, or don't plan on listening to the interview, I, uh, I encourage you to check out. Uh, this week's interview discussion, which is myself talking with a trader, a uh, former trader from PNM named Dax Contreras and Larry Behrens of Power of the Future New Mexico. Uh, I think it's a great discussion, great explanation of some of the issues with the merger, some of the potential benefits of the merger and problems with it as well, and just electricity markets in general. But Wally, What's your take on Avangrid and its big offer for PNM? Well, you know, um, count me as one of those that's a bit skeptical on the Energy Transition Act. Uh, I think I've used the phrase uh, aspirational regulation, meaning this is something we would like to get to. And uh, having said that, there are uh, very strong benchmarks to get to uh, no carbon emission electricity by certain points. You know, they had similar things in parts of Europe and the technology has not changed that much and they failed miserably. Uh, we've seen batteries have a bigger and bigger role in uh, various utilities plans, but we've seen lots of problems with regard to getting those to scale. So uh, I sort of have a feeling Paul, that we will see some slippage in the Energy Transition Act. Now, what does that mean? You know, a, a company like Avangrid, uh, if they uh, refuse to have anything to do with direct ownership, with uh, any fossil generation source, that's all well and good. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as it was talked about in the uh, interview podcast, uh, the grid is stabilized by coal and nuclear and natural gas and in all likelihood will be uh, stabilized by those for a long time to come. And the other issue that strikes me as interesting is that without batteries being a huge part of the mix, uh, there, are, there are cases where natural gas combined cycle has less carbon dioxide emissions than renewable energy with single phase or single cycle backup gen. And so, you know, it's a little counterintuitive when you say, how can that be? But it's possible that wind and solar may not be as environmentally friendly as, uh, as the word on the street is. From an engineering point of view, carbon emissions, the mining it takes, the recycling of the materials. There's a lot of issues uh, to be uh, addressed, and I have a feeling they will be addressed in the coming uh, years in New Mexico. And like I say, if I, were a, if I were a betting person on this, I would say they would revisit many of those out of necessity, whether it be uh, destabilization of the grid and the power always being off, uh, a la California, or the rates going up more than people can tolerate, a la California. 
So I think we have a model for where this goes in the future, and it's California, and so far it doesn't look real pretty. Yeah, a couple of uh, points before we move on from that one. I, you know, definitely, Avangrid is a company that is dedicated to so-called green energy and renewables, whether that is a more politically oriented dedication or their bottom line because they can get subsidies and uh, you know, other things out of the deal, uh, whatever that may be, uh, this is a philosophically like-minded company in terms of uh, what the policies here are in New Mexico. Uh, I would argue that most of the negative aspects of what's happening to New Mexico's utility grid have already been baked into the equation by the Energy Transition Act and then the PRC adoption of 100% renewable uh, energy. That is the negative here. It's not Avangrid per se. Perhaps the policies of the ETA made Avangrid look, uh, look at New Mexico and look at P&M for potential purchase. They did pay a hefty premium, 19.3%. Uh, the governor did get a $2,500 donation from the company last year. So uh, they may have been looking at New Mexico in, in this situation. And who knows what that relationship uh, is. And hopefully some of that will come out. And that's kind of my final point, which is the Public Regulation Commission will have to sign off on this deal. That body is being considered for reconfiguration uh, thanks to a constitutional amendment that would give the governor... Uh, essentially the control over uh, putting forth and nominating PRC commissioners. It would be a three-member body as opposed to the elected five-member body. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't even place bets at this point as to whether the PRC will go along with it uh, in this purchase or not. But yeah, there are just facts out there that are relative and interesting to this whole discussion that need to be uh, considered. And, uh, you know, something that came to mind when you were talking is, you know, P&M was virtually uh, entirely invested in New Mexico and a little bit into Texas. And that made them susceptible, if you will, to the political challenges and even bullying of New Mexico politicians, which is not a position you want to be in in any business. That's why one of the reasons why we have so few businesses headquartered here or focused in New Mexico, uh, it's a very hostile environment for businesses. Avangrid, when push comes to shove with New Mexico regulatory authorities, they may be in a better position to say, you know, look, we're not going to play ball with you. We're not going to just kowtow to you or, or jump up and salute when you tell us to do X, Y, and Z. The, these guys are, these are the big boys. This is a, a internationally consolidated uh, utility owner and provider that works on at least three or four continents. So they, they've got resources to spread around and they've got the power to say, look, if you don't like the way we're doing things in New Mexico, all think, you know, relatively, then you can jump in a lake to an extent. I mean, they, they could lose New Mexico business and not have to uh, fold up the company or anything. Yeah, but the, the key with uh, public utility regulation, electric regulation, is they get to set your prices. Right. And so, uh, you know, I think that through all of this, notwithstanding whether you care deeply about uh, wind and solar and you think it's the greatest thing for the environment uh, that could ever happen or you're more skeptical like me if the rates go up and reliability is down it's going to be very tough on whoever the incumbent utility is to deal with whether it's an appointed or a elected regulatory body the PRC or, or uh, its successor uh, that's on the uh, the ballot constitutional amendment. If they're able to weave their way through and keep reliability up and keep the prices from going up a lot, I think they'll have a great deal of latitude and flexibility to go forward. 
And that's the, uh, the big question that remains to be seen. If they're able to do it, um, my, uh, my hat's off to them. They will be, you know, they will be the first large scale example that I've found that has been able to do that. You know, whether it's PNM or PNM now under this uh, merger acquisition deal that's uh, put forth. Uh, the other thing that I will say before I close this out is there is some language uh, when you talk about uh, the integrated resource plan, the very complicated way that utilities uh, plan for the future and their future generation sources and the cost of those and the reliability. A lot of times PNM talked about certain scenarios having a lower cost other than what they were doing. So um, I liken that to... Uh, the federal budget where a reduction in an increase was called a decrease in the federal budget. I don't think that nuance was captured by the body politic in New Mexico and certainly not by the ratepayer in person on the street. And so we'll see if, uh, if some of that kind of uh, squishy language uh, comes to play and say, well, it's yes, it's going up, but it would have gone up even more. I'm not sure that's what people uh, signed off on and were prepared for here in New Mexico. No doubt about it. Well, lots to talk about still with uh, Avangrid. We'll see how that all shakes out. But I definitely commend uh, the Thursday interview that will come out with Larry Barons and Max Contreras about Avangrid. It is a true uh, Ph.D. class in uh, electricity grids and the way they're managed, and it'll be very inf informational to anyone who is interested. Uh, now, getting back to more mundane economic challenges facing New Mexico, uh, the latest Wallet Hub report on states and their recoveries in terms of unemployment rates is out. Uh, New Mexico remains in a uh, deep economic hole, uh, thanks largely to the governor's lockdown policies. Uh, we are, according to Wallet Hub, the uh, third, fourth lowest recovery state in the country relative to the start of the year. So since the start of the year, our unemployment rate has recovered less. Technically, it's actually very strong at the beginning of the year, then it plummeted, or it went, you know, the, the unemployment rate was, uh, really bad during the heart of the COVID-19 shut, shutdown, and then things have opened up in most states a fair amount. The states that are doing the worst, uh, they're Kansas, Florida, Louisiana, and then New Mexico. Uh, best states for highest recovery, interesting Michigan. You know, their governor, certainly uh, Whitmer, got uh, a lot of bad press, at least I call it bad because I disagreed pretty strongly with her policies early on. Uh, you know, apparently was the target of uh, some kind of domestic terrorist <laughs> attack or something. But Michigan is number one in terms of best recovery since the start of 2020. South Carolina, Connecticut, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. So that's all driven by COVID-19 and, uh, and the policies and recoveries thereof. Uh, of course... The new unemployment figures are also out for uh, September, and New Mexico is far in excess of, of our neighbors. Uh, in terms of unemployment rates, 9.4%. Interestingly, Texas at 8.3%, the next highest state in the region after New Mexico, 6.7% in Arizona, 6.4% in Colorado, and 5%. That's like New Mexico in normal times for Utah. So uh, we are definitely not doing as well economically. So we have the lockdowns, which have clearly failed to stop the spread of the virus. And those are killing our economy. So we are really getting a double whammy in New Mexico on both fronts. Yeah, and the, uh, the other issue that we talk about some, but we haven't talked a lot about is the uh, fact that o the oil industry is so down in New Mexico. So that's the other, uh, if you look under the uh, economic statistics, it's always uh, under the mining uh, category, but most of that mining is actually extractive industry with regard to oil and gas is the biggest employer by far. That's way, way down. So 
Also, a huge source of gross receipts tax in terms of drilling new wells. You know, back uh, before things slowed down, over 100 drilling rigs now under 50, uh, 45 the last I looked. So there's a there's a lot there's a lot to be said there. And then uh, that's possibly uh, also why our neighbor, Texas, who usually is an economic powerhouse, all things being considered, is also struggling a bit as they're a big energy state, too. And so we'll have to see how all that plays out. Uh, one thing we have talked a lot about is the best type of diversification is adding more and uh, different industries to your state not increasing diversification by killing the ones that you have. So we'll have to see how that plays because oil and gas is so baked into the economy of New Mexico. And speaking of which, while you were doing, uh, you're talking about the oil and gas, the price of crude oil, it was a very down day in the stock market today. We don't normally talk about that, but it was a 600-point uh, decline in the Dow, uh, 650, I should say, 2.3%. Concern about the spread of the virus is what the analysts are saying, affected it, uh, and crude oil is $38.60, so down 3.14%. Uh, we've kind of hovered around that $40 threshold for a while in terms of oil prices, and, uh, you know, that's, that's getting towards the low side, and, uh, you know, we'll see if that gets lower, uh, of course. Who knows, maybe uh, with the onset of winter, and if, if New Mexico is any indication, we just went straight from summer to winter, and maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe that'll goose natural gas prices a little bit, but that it's going to take a lot of demand to uh, have an impact on natural gas production. Uh, but speaking of that subject area, the final presidential debate was uh, last week, and... Trump behaved himself. He was a good boy. He didn't interrupt Biden too many times. He looks at least like a, a normal human being there, which was all for the well and good. But the main news out of that debate was that Joe Biden said, almost in a throwaway, he was kind of challenged by Trump mm -hmm. to talk about uh, his policies relating to energy. And Biden said, we are going to transition away from oil and gas. Then he said something about stop subsidizing the industry. Now, I, I will definitely give you an opportunity to weigh in here. But uh, uh, first and foremost, that language is very reminiscent of what the governor said in an uh, uh, event with Gavin uh, Newsom and other uh, luminaries, governors from the West, uh, when she was talking uh, to the Climate Council about her uh, plans for green energy and making New Mexico more uh, you know, green, et cetera. Uh, and then the whole stop subsidizing the industry. Now, if you're talking oil and natural gas, those are very unsubsidized products. I'm not saying there's none, but on nothing on the scale of renewables, especially when you're talking about per kilowatt hours. You know? Well, and yeah, and when you look at um, dollars of taxation relative to dollars of revenue or of net income, extremely heavily taxed industry. Yeah. And so... If you're saying what, you know, we're going to stop subsidizing them, I don't know what that means. Do we not give them depreciation, which basically every business gets, deductibility of interest? You know, I'm not sure. And that's exactly. what they often do is, is lump in a tax credit for uh, as a subsidy, which that, subs that tax credit could be available to any industry. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure what they really mean there. It's one of those things that uh, that, you know, scratch a little bit beneath the surface and see what really is going on there. Because, uh, you know, without a doubt, there are, uh, there are, quote, true subsidies in energy. You know, there's been wind and solar credits that are direct subsidies to uh, the industry. There are, uh, there are, well, there's clean coal. And let's well, yeah, it, the uh, 45Q credit yeah. to uh, capture carbon dioxide right. from coal and other industries. Considered yeah, it's being considered. Yeah, it's that that is the law of the land. It, it would be tough to not consider that uh, a subsidy. But I think it gets a lot harder to point to where the big subsidy is for oil and natural gas, you know, produced uh, domestically in the U.S. So uh, yeah. maybe add something in mind. I certainly don't know uh, what it would be or pretend to. I'll let his... Uh, his minions and his underlings kind of parse that into what that really means. But yeah, 
that that is a, a little bit bridge too far for me to say that yeah that this is this wildly subsidized industry yeah at one time you would hear well oh uh, america's foreign policy uh, is a subsidy to the oil and gas industry you know the war in iraq back during george yeah. w bush and yeah i can see it i don't think george w bush did that because he wanted uh, anything to do with oil and gas prices he had a bone to pick with iraq and uh, it really didn't have to do with securing our crude oil. And nowadays, especially well, because we have all the oil we can use here, there's really no reason for oil and gas uh, to affect our foreign policy. So do we need to give the industry more credit than we've given them? They, so give them a credit because they've uh, prevented us from going to war. Who knows? It's one of those things that, like I see, these statements are easy to make, but you know, what does it really mean? And what are you what are you proposing from a policy point of view? It certainly sounds like the sort of red meat from a, a, a very rabid environmental point of view. Yes. Oh, my God, they're getting these subsidies. We need to take those away. What do you what what uh, is the policy that you think that they're getting that they don't deserve? And what's your plans to do that? And so yeah. until I hear that, I don't know. Other than the fact that, yeah, sounds good. But what does it mean? And the final one is uh, externalities, Wally. Well, I was thinking of that. Uh, it's like, Paul, I didn't want to go there because uh, that'll make my head explode. But uh, what, Paul, what are externalities? Well, externalities <laughs> are positive or negative things that uh, you can experience as a result of somebody else's activity. I, I'll throw a simple example out there. That's not included in the... Explicit price. Right. Is that correct? Is yeah, would that be, would you agree with that? In a, in a sense, externalities can mean anything you want them to be. <laughs> and, and not good and bad. So yeah. here's a perfect example. Say it's the 4th of July, and you live next to somebody who is a big fan of fireworks. And, well, we know this year all the major displays were canceled. The city put on some stuff. But maybe you didn't, don't live in Albuquerque. You live somewhere where those particular fireworks were not able to be seen. Well, you got a free fireworks display. You didn't have to spend a penny because your neighbor is over there hauling off fireworks left and right. And it's beautiful and wonderful. And that's a pretty good example. That's a pretty good one. Because on the other side, somebody who hates fireworks with a vengeance says, Paul, oh my goodness, I, had, I hate fireworks. They scare me. They scare my dog. And now exactly. they're right next to me. So. And yeah, so, so what, became, what was a positive externality at 8 o'clock in the evening becomes a much more negative externality at midnight or beyond. Or a positive externality on the 4th of July, but on the 2nd and 3rd and 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and into July, definitely negative. There you go. So uh, that is, externalities are a real thing, but to actually measure them and account for them in any significant way. And agree on what the even, exactly. and even agree, you know, that's one of the things, there's a lot of arguments in economics where you can agree on a baseline of assumptions and approach to things. A lot of people that totally disagree about the conclusions that come on top of those. Externality seems like it starts off with a disagreement at the beginning and only goes downhill from there. You got it. Well, the final conversation topic, voting. Now, Wally, I voted this week. Have you voted? Have you done your civic duty, Wally? Paul, here's what happened. Uh, you you dog ate your ballot. <laughs> no. Okay. It's so nasty out there. You know, I'd been driving by the early polling places, and there's lines out there because oh. it'd been 70 degrees and pleasant. Everyone... I looked out and the snow is blowing and it's cold out there. I was like, I bet there's not much of a line. And sure enough, there was not. So I actually uh, voted over the lunch hour today. So Fantastic. Well, now we get to talk yeah. about all that excitement. So first and foremost, I voted. And I know you know a lot of people are listening to this outside of the, uh, the metro area here. I voted at the Clerks Annex in Bernalillo County, which is where they do early voting, but they also keep it open for... Uh, voting during, you know, so I've had early, early voting, I guess is the way to properly say it, because it's two weeks before the regular sites open up, but the foundation is now based downtown, and I did that last week, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, 
and uh, did not wait in line. I, I have a thing about lines. I'll wait for a roller coaster, but I, you know, if I'm early voting, I really don't feel like I should be waiting in line to vote. And I, I knew that the lines would go down. It was like Christmas morning. It was like early COVID runs on toilet paper. Exactly. People were all out <laughs> in force waiting an hour plus lines to early vote. I knew it would go down, and sure enough, it did. So I went down and voted myself. So I'm glad you got to vote yeah. with no line. Where, where was your voting site? Um, uh up on uh, Central and Tramway, the Four Hills Shopping Center. So, uh, yeah, went relatively smooth. People were coming through. Uh, if you're a first-time voter, they kind of ring the bell. It reminded me of oh. being at a bar or, you know, I, they did a little cheer. Um, I heard a bell. I don't know if that was uh, just my imagination. But it reminded me of uh, the gang of cheerleaders who say, Norm! But, you know, so that was good. And the, the lady who was checking me in says, well, we should celebrate people who vote a lot like you. So it's like, well, thank you for noticing that. There you that. go. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I am glad that you did that. And I'm, uh, you know, also, I, we've encouraged, as we always do, people to vote early. Uh, it's just better. You know, the, the weather outside this particular afternoon is uh, quite frightful. I, if this was election day, there might be people on the margins that didn't go out to vote. I do suspect that the polling places will largely be ghost towns on uh, election day because I think virtually everybody who plans to vote will have voted before election day. I just think people are, are so passionate and so excited about this election, whether they like the candidates or not, that are running for the president or other offices. Uh, I, I just think that they're going to be uh, you know, doing that. So uh, we, we will have... Uh, one more podcast until uh, election day so we will have predictions then but uh, if you are willing well i will jump jump first here and i'm not going to go down the entire ballot but i will say that i uh, pulled the trigger so to speak for only the second time in my presidential voting history for a major party candidate i have voted for the uh third party more often than not and uh, the first time since 2000, I voted for uh, a major party candidate. I voted for George W. Bush back in 2000. I consider his presidency one of the worst in American history, but that's a subject for another podcast. Uh, however, I chose to vote for Donald J. Trump this time around. And uh, if you're willing to disclose, we're willing to listen, Wally. Um, I voted for... I voted for someone who is currently president. All right. Well, that's, that's good enough for me. Uh, you know, uh, I, I really, aside from all the economic things we talk about, and uh, I think it's safe to say that deregulation and uh, you know, his general trying to, generally trying to reduce the scope of regulatory burdens faced by businesses, including especially American oil and gas uh, producers in that industry. And Obama did a few good things too. Let's let's face it, the uh, crude oil exports came during Obama, and that was an undeniably good thing. That was something that our governor, probably the single best thing that she's ever done in public policy, in my humble opinion, was to vote for a standalone crude oil export bill. But Donald Trump is really focused on that issue, but also from a uh, foreign policy perspective, he hasn't gotten us into any wars. I, I truly value that. And, uh, you know, he's he's a wild card. He's a wild man, and I wish uh, his Twitter account maybe had been uh, those left wingers at Twitter had blocked his Twitter account months ago. <laughs> it might have gone better for him. But uh, we'll see what happens this election. Uh, and I've got a whole array of media performances and media appointments for election night. But since this podcast will go. Uh, uh, this the next podcast will be uh, recorded and available before then. We won't get into predictions or anything for all that, but we're going to come prepared next week to predict who wins the presidency, uh, congressional races around New Mexico, uh, dominance of the Senate, which is hugely important. So, uh, yeah, uh, both both uh, nationally and in the state of New Mexico, right. both. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, anywho. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. 
Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.